There are a lot of different approaches to discussing the resurrection, particularly the historicity of it, uh, what it means, things like that. And the approach that we're going to do today is going to be following the work of this man, uh, N.T. Wright, who wrote uh, these books here that I'll be drawing from. There you go, a little illustration. Um, and his, uh, his question in this series, uh, this series is called, the Christ uh, is called Christian Origins and the Question of God. And the question that he is answering is, how exactly do we go from Judaism of the Second Temple period, so that's the time period from 500 to 200-ish AD, um, and then we have all of these uh, works written by Jews around this time. Then we have all of these works uh, written by the early church fathers. And there are massive differences between the theology of what, say, you know, Irenaeus uh, has to say and what um, someone like Josephus or uh, Rabbi Hillel has to say. And so um, the, there's continuity between uh, these two identities. Christianity is, in a sense, Jewish. And yet there's massive uh, difference between them as well. And Wright's project is how to explain the emergence of Christianity from the uh, uh, Judaism from which it emerged. Um, and so his project starts off by doing what I just did, which is you sketch out Second Temple Judaism, you sketch out the early church fathers. Then his second book is uh, covering the, uh, one of the largest uh, figures, Jesus, in the movement. Uh, and it's a book all about Jesus. And that's what this book is here, Jesus. And then the second book is covering the second most important uh, figure. In, sorry. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. This, his intended second book was um, to cover the, the second most important figure of early Christianity, which is, of course, Paul, right? He's the other most, uh, uh, other pillar figure. So those are the two pillar figures that he has in mind that he's going to explain. He said originally it'll take me three books, one book to cover the history, one book on Jesus, one book on Paul. To date, the series is up to seven books, I think, six or seven, depending on how you count it, uh, because he can't stop writing. Um, the questions are, are just like that. Um, but anyway, one of his big works is this, this work here, because he started the Jesus volume, and then at the end of it, he was going to answer the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And he originally said, you know, I figure it'll just be a chapter, right? And we can kind of tie up those loose ends. But that chapter ended up being volume three in the series, which is this, um, which is longer than the original Jesus book. So. Um, his approach is what we'll be following, and I'm essentially digesting just kind of his main points that he's making throughout this series. Um, and his argument essentially is a sociological argument, which is that the beliefs of the early Christians and the emergence of that community really cannot be explained unless something like the resurrection of Jesus occurred. So for some of you that have been here before, we've spent a lot of time going into what's called histori uh, historiography, where we, uh, rather than looking at the broad overview of sort of the, uh, the early church as a society, we look at it more, um, here are all the sources, here are the New Testament, here's what, uh, you know, here's what is um, attested to here, 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 here's these criteria of historicity. We're not gonna follow that method. So I'm largely going to be making some histori uh, historiographical assumptions about the reliability of the Gospels and things like that. I'll try to be clear about the assumptions that I'm making, but if at any point you think I'm making a questionable assumption, uh, just please press me on it and we can, we can talk about it uh, some more. Okay, so like I said, the first objective here today is to provide historical and theological context to better understand the early Christian proclamation of the resurrection. And secondly, our second objective is to formulate that into an actual argument that Jesus rose from the dead. All right, so as an entry point, we need to talk about Christian hope. So I'll start here with our uh, keystone verse. For those of you, I see some of you from Flick on, on Tuesday. Um, we talked about this verse some. So uh, in your hearts, honor uh, Christ the Lord as holy, always being uh, prepared to make a defense, or apologia, apologetics, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do so with gentleness and respect. So the question we're gonna start with is, what is this hope? Like, what, what, what does it mean to have hope uh, in the Christian faith? Or put it another way, like, what's the point? Okay, think about it for a second. What is the hope that a Christian has? And what is the hope that you're defending? 
if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, what is the hope that's being communicated that, to you? Um, there, there are a lot of different answers to this question. And one of the uh, answers, courtesy of my sort of rural East Texas upbringing, is what I call billboard Christianity. And billboard Christianity is what you see on billboards, such as this one. Yes. And this is, and so if you ask some people, why are you a Christian? Oh, because I don't want to go to hell when I die. Or more positively, I want to go to heaven when I die. And some people uh, even present the gospel in this way. You know, Adam and Eve sin made everything bad, but Jesus came and died. Now we get to live with God forever in heaven. And um, there is perhaps a little bit of truth to this, but there are some very serious complications with this uh, and, and limitations to this approach. So for one, it's extremely individualistic. It's all about what happens to me when I die. Hmm, what's, how can I best save my skin whenever, it, uh, whenever, the, the, um, whenever my time comes? Which does not seem really good. You know, it's, it seems very self-motivated. Uh, secondly, it sort of disparages the goodness of material creation. Because if it's all about getting to heaven when you die, what's the point of doing anything here on earth? What's the point of taking care of your body or caring for the environment or uh, you know, building a society in a way that's productive or positive? If it's all going to be, if, you're go if the whole point is that we'll fly away and escape at some point, then why even care about material creation? Thirdly, and this is my favorite one, there's no connection to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and just as a side note, the Hebrew Bible and the Protestant Old Testament, those are the same, the same thing. Um, but I prefer the Hebrew Bible because Old Testament is sometimes read as pejorative against our, our Jewish friends. Um, and as a note to our Roman Catholic friends, Hebrew Bible does not include uh, the seven bonus books. Um, but there's no connection with the Hebrew Bible at all on this view, right? It, what I just said, oh, there's Adam and Eve. Okay, let's give lip service to let's, the first page of the Hebrew Bible and then skip 75% of the story just to jump all the way up to Jesus. And it, the point that we're talking about today, what I mentioned, is that Jesus spoke to uh, Jewish people in a Jewish context and answered their concerns. And so the hope that Jesus represents has to be a hope for the Jewish people as it is for us today. So if we just uh, excise 75% or, or, or the entire Hebrew Bible, then uh, there's a major problem. And then most significantly for today, there's no room for resurrection. And this is where um, we're... Uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time defining resurrection. So I think most of us are probably aware of this, but I do want to spend time because there's a great deal of uh, confusion and still distortion on, on what we mean by this. So succinctly, resurrection is reconstitution of a dead body back into an alive body. It's a very physical thing. That which was physically dead is now physically alive. It's not a redescription of death. So sometimes people will say things like, you know, grandma went to heaven, or uh, he's gone to meet his maker, or he's joined the choir invisible, or uh, he's pining for the fjords, you know, other sort of ways of getting, circumlocuting around the question of he's dead. We don't say, oh, he resurrected. That's not what's meant by that. It's not, uh, so if it's not a redescription of death, it's actually a reversal of death. And this is... Um, the way that Wright uh, likes to put it pithily is that resurrection is not what happens to you after you survive uh, death, as it were. It's not you're a spirit now or something like that. That's life after death. Resurrection is life after life after death. At some point after, after you die, whatever existence you continue in, that will be reversed and you'll be reconstituted back to life. And that is the claim of what happened uh, to Jesus. So I've said a lot about what New Testament or what Christian hope isn't, and I've talked a little bit about resurrection. But let's kind of tie this together and say what New Testament hope is. And so in short, the claim of Christianity is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And what God did for Jesus, he will eventually do for the entire universe. The good creation that, uh, that God made has been mired by evil, but it will be set right and restored as the kingdom of heaven is established here on earth. That's why it says in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, sorry, thy kingdom come 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's about the future promise of earthly renewal. And the role of the church is to enter into that work, uh, the work that Jesus started, uh, to bring that promise of the future as much as we can into the present. Um, and to live not as citizens of earth, but as citizens of heaven. Not with the sense of, oh, I'm going to escape earth, but saying that the kingdoms of earth are not the legitimate kingdoms. It's the kingdom of heaven that's the legitimate kingdom. It will one day be established on earth, but we will live as citizens of that future kingdom. So uh, that is essentially the, the core message of, of the gospel. And when we say kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, and when Jesus used a phrase such as, uh, you will know that the kingdom of God is among you, he was evoking the entirety of the Old Testament story, sorry, Hebrew Bible story, the entire Hebrew story up to that point when he was saying that. So it wasn't just talking about escaping uh, earth, as it were. So the question, again, is how exactly did this belief arise uh, in the first century? So this gets us to the thesis. Early Christians were Second Temple Jews who believed Jesus was the Messiah because he was resurrected from the dead. The origin of this belief and the community founded around it is best explained by the historical fact that Jesus actually resurrected from the dead. So our roadmap for tonight is going to be focusing kind of on those three main movements. First, uh, that we're gonna discuss what Second Temple Judaism means. Um, then we'll talk very briefly about the Jesus movement in its historical context. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with the emergence of resurrection belief and I'll present the actual argument and we'll discuss it uh, from there. So we'll start uh, here. I'll pause. Are there any comments or questions thus far? Mm. Glad to know that uh, you're either keeping your negative thoughts to yourself or, or I'm on, on a good track. All right. So let's start with Second Temple Judaism. Just show of hands, uh, how many of you have heard this term before? OK. All right. All right, good. I was, I was a bit nervous on that one. So pop quiz, if there's a second temple, what does that mean? There was a first temple, correct. <laughs> so that is where the story starts. So the first temple was built, and I promise, you may be thinking, oh, what does this have to do with resurrection? I promise it gets there. It, it, it'll get there. Um, so the first temple was built at about 965-ish BC uh, by Solomon. Um, and this... Uh, represents sort of the, the ideal of the Jewish hope. You have a mighty king in Solomon. He's the king of the United, you know, the, uni the, uh, the United Mar Monarchy of Israel and Judah is all brought together. They've built uh, this house for the Lord. Um, they've been wandering in the wilderness. Um, and now they have their own land, they have their kingdom, and their God is in their midst. And there's a great passage here in 1 Kings 8 which describes the dedication of the temple. Um, and it says here that when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud fill, filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And then Solomon said, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. And I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. Now, what's important is that this is not just a house. Like this isn't just a temple. This is a deeply theologically and politically significant building for the Hebrew people. Most importantly, uh, temples, and this isn't unique to Judaism at all, um, but temples are seen as the union of heaven and earth. So just as we were talking about that hope that at some point heaven will come to earth, the kingdom of heaven will come to earth, in a small micro, the, the temple is a small microcosm of that, where the presence of God is present, is, is here on earth. Or as we're, we will soon sing at Christmas time, you know, the presence of God has, or God has made his dwelling place with man, right? That's the idea with, with, uh, with the temple. So it's not just, oh, here's a building where we slaughter animals. It's no, this is, this is where heaven and earth overlap. Um, and importantly, you get this identity that the king of, of, um, the king of Judah is the temple builder. So David planned the temple, Solomon built the temple. The good king is the one who cleanses, keeps the temple uh, built and clean and all of that uh, good stuff. That'll be uh, important later. So this is the, the, first, uh, the first temple. Now, um, I'm going to skip. Uh, oh, now, riddle me this. If there's a first temple and there's a second temple, what does that mean happened to the first temple? Yeah, exactly. It didn't last, right? So uh, in 586 BC, I'm skipping a lot here. There's a lot of interesting political intrigue that we're skipping over for, for the sake of discussion. 
Um, but in 586, the Babylonian uh, Empire invades Judah. They destroy the temple. They sack Jerusalem. They leave everyone into exile. Um, and then uh, if you want to read a very harrowing book of the Bible, the book of Lamentations is, a, is Jeremiah's uh, uh, lament over uh, the city of Jerusalem after it's been tackle, uh, taken over by uh, uh, Babylon. Now, what's important is that just as the temple is not just a building, this event is not just an event. So the destruction of the temple is more than just a building being destroyed. It's the literal rending of heaven and earth, which, as we often will say that, is an apocalyptic type event. I'd move heaven and earth for you, things like that. But for the Jewish people, the only way that God's uh, uh, dwelling place could be destroyed is if God allowed it to be destroyed. And the only reason he would do that is if he abandoned it. So if you read in uh, Ezekiel 1, this is, this is how the book of Ezekiel starts off with um, Ezekiel by the, the Kebron Canal. And he looks and he sees in a visionary uh, uh, moment, he sees the glory of God leaving the temple and going off into Babylon uh, and, and abandoning, it, abandoning it and allowing... Um, the uh, Babylonians to come in and destroy it. Um, and so then they have no land, no kingdom, no temple, and no God. So this is the period of exile. Uh, and it seems like there's no hope, but there is, uh, believe it or not, hope in the form of a man named Cyrus, uh, king of Persia. So the Persian Empire comes along and destroys the Babylonian Empire. And one of the first things that Cyrus does is decree that all the Jews can return to Judea and gives them um, funding to rebuild uh, their temple. So you think, oh, this is a good thing. Um, you know, we're going to get our second temple built. Uh, this man is restoring the national fortunes of Israel. That's great. But here's the thing. The legacy of the second temple was much more ambiguous uh, than the first temple. Um, so I'll... Uh, I'll actually read this passage. So in, um, in the book of Ezra, it describes the, the completion of, uh, or it, it, it describes the laying of the foundation of the temple. And it says here that when the builders laid the foundation of the second temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. Um, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. And all the people responded with a great shout, um, when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord had been laid. But here's the interesting part. So you think it's an unambiguously good thing. But many of the priests and Levites and old people who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted for joy. And so you have this incident where um, there's weeping, there's you know, weeping and celebration mixed together. And the reason for this is because unlike the first temple, there's no visible sign that God has returned to his people. They've just built a building, and people were singing and you know, celebrating it. But there's no cloud that descends, there's no, and, and this temple's way shabbier than, than the old temple. And it leads to this big question, are we still in exile? Which is the core question facing the, uh, the Hebrews when we get to the, the period of the New Testament. They have a building, but they're living under the dominion of a foreign king, and there's no sign that their God has returned to them. Um, it's never really explicitly answered in the Hebrew Bible whether or not uh, uh, exile was actually over with. So now we're going to get out of the uh, Old Testament period and into the uh, skipping ahead here. The Persians eventually collapse, uh, as empires are wont to do, and it leads to the next empire, which is uh, um, Alexander the Great's uh, Greek Empire. Uh, I'll skip over the details. It's essentially, we're going to refer to them as the Greeks. Technically, there's the Seleucids, but we'll call them the Greeks. Um, Things are relatively quiet until a man named Antiochus IV uh, comes to the throne and decides that he hates the Jews and wants to destroy them. So he invades uh, uh, Judea, or uh, he invades Judea, he ransacks the temple, he causes a bunch of problems. And then, as Josephus reports, for Antiochus, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem, the looting, the wholesale slaughter, that just was not enough. His psychopathic tendency was exacerbated by resentment at what the siege had cost him, and he tried to force the Jews to violate their traditional codes by, of practice by leaving their infant sons uncircumcised and sacrificing pigs on the altar. So one of the things that he did, remember how the, the, the king of Judah, the good king, is the, uh, the temple builder. What Antiochus did was convert the Jews' temple into a temple for Zeus uh, and started slaughtering pigs there, which was not very popular. Um, and it's also during this time period that um, we have a doctrinal development. So 
um, uh, th this is where the doctrine of resurrection starts to become much uh, more formulated. So um, there's actually a nice passage here from the book of 2 Maccabees that illustrates uh, both of these things. So there's a really famous story from this time period of uh, the mother of seven martyrs. Um, and I'll just read it to you um, briefly. Um, essentially, she has seven, a mother of seven sons, is, uh, and all the seven sons are martyred under Antiochus. Uh, but what we want to notice here is the way in which their hope in the doctrine of resurrection uh, uh, shows through in, in this particular story. So it happened that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and thongs to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. One of them, acting as their spokesman, said, what do you intend uh, to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. And so they kill the first two brothers. Um, after the first and second brothers were killed, the, the third was the victim of their sport. And when it was demanded, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hand. And he said nobly, I got these from heaven. And because of his laws, I disdain them. And from him, I hope to get them back again. And as a result, the king himself and those that were with him were astonished at the young man's spirit, uh, for he regarded his sufferings as nothing. And after he too had died, they maltreated and tortured the fourth in the same way. And when he was near death, he said, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of mortals and cherish the hope uh, God gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection uh, to life. So this is, a, first of all, it illustrates, okay, what the historicity of this is complicated to say the least. But it illustrates first some of the nonsense Antiochus was doing to the Jews. But for our purpose uh, tonight, you can see this is the first uh, real explicit confession of faith in a doctrine of resurrection, um, exclusively from a Jewish uh, perspective. And um, to put a bit more detail behind this, what, what the brothers are alluding to here is that um, God at the end of time will uh, raise the righteous dead, all the dead martyrs who fought in the cause for Israel, will raise them from the dead. He will establish Judah, the kingdom of Judah, on earth, and then allow the righteous dead to enjoy the physical blessings of, the, of that material kingdom. So that's essentially what they're getting at. They're saying, you can kill us. It doesn't matter. At the end of days, the, your Greek empire will be overthrown. Our kingdom will be established by our God, and our God will bring us back from the dead uh, so that we can enjoy uh, our blessings here. So that's essentially what's going on. All right. Um, I'm running a little short on time, a little behind, because we've got to get to Jesus eventually. So I'll, <laughs> yeah. So to be uh, really quick here, uh, eventually there's a guy named Judah Maccabee that rises up against uh, the Seleucids, uh, the Greek Empire. He has a surprising victory, which is celebrated in the book of, uh, <laughs> celebrated in the holiday of Hanukkah. His story is told in the book of Maccabees, books of Maccabees. Um, and the important thing here is that he, uh, he ultimately established an independent kingdom. And the first thing that he did was cleanse the temple of all of its Greek influence. So you have in here a proto-Messiah, as it were. The man who overthrows the pagan rulers uh, and cleanses the temple, rededicates it to the um, worship of God, and then establishes an independent uh, kingdom. Uh, this is where things get extremely, they, things go really off the rails here, because uh, we're talking about the Hasmonean dynasty. I'm just going to completely skip over this uh, and say that they established a kingdom and it didn't last very long because of uh, a bunch of in, uh, intermarrying and nonsense. Lines of succession were a mess. Anyway, the point is, at the end of the Hasmonean dynasty, you end up with a guy named King Herod the Great who says, I'm a friend of Rome, which is the newest empire on the scene. And the first thing that Herod does is he says, I'm king of the Jews, and we're friends with Rome now. Um, but to validate his claim that he's the king of the Jews, the real one, the first thing he does is build out uh, the temple. So remember, the second temple was really shabby. Um, so he built it out uh, a lot more. And his thinking behind this was, now, you know, my subjects will recognize I'm the true king because I put all this money into building the temple. To give you an idea of how much money it was, this is Solomon's temple, and that is Herod's temple. So he put a lot of effort into this. But he went just a little too far because he put a Roman eagle on the temple to show, oh, we're loyal to Rome. And it turns out that putting the sign of a pagan kingdom on your 
what's supposed to be you know the central defining um, uh, building of your of your independent um, identity was not a good idea. Ended up having a small revolt on his hands, but. Everybody knows Herod the Great more popularly as being a part of the Christmas story, and so that means that we have now arrived at the Jesus movement. And we are now and now all of you are experts in Second Temple Judaism. Yes. So that was a lot of information. That was a lot of information, I know. Um, and the, the most important thing is you don't need to keep all the dates and names straight in your head. The thing the, the main storyline of Second Temple Judaism is we had a temple, we had a land, it was taken from us, God abandoned us. It's not clear he's coming back. We, and so we should overthrow the pagans. There, there needs to be somebody or something to overthrow the pagans to build the temple and then uh, uh, let us return uh, from exile um, spiritually and, and physically. So I'll pause really quickly here. If there are any, uh, if there are any questions? Believe it or not, we're almost, we're almost done. I only have like six slides, believe it or not. So when Herod built the temple, like did the Jews recognize that like God could have lived there, even though know, like they didn't, like he was a not Jew? This is an excellent question because it perfectly segues into the next thing. One thing I've glossed over is I've been saying the Jews. Um, there are no the Jews. There are Judaisms. So even in this room, a lot of us may be, may identify as the label as Christian, but we, uh, those of us that do, recognize there's a great deal of diversity between us, and we can disagree on a lot of stuff. Even today, you can have Christians disagree over radically different uh, things. Um, currently, there's a lot of midterm stuff going on, so I don't know if any of y'all know Raphael Warnock. He's, the, uh, 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 he's a very famous pastor running for senator in, in Georgia uh, on the Democratic ticket. He's an interesting character because he's uh, um, a very deeply devout and religious man, but very much opposed to what's considered the religious right. So even though you can have people like him and say, I, I don't want to get too political, um, but someone, some, you, know, you can imagine that uh, uh, someone like him and uh, someone that might go to a, I don't know, a church, an unnamed church in rural East Texas uh, might have very similar spiritual views, but radically different political views. Anyway, the point is, the Jewish people were exactly the same way. Um, and there were multiple parties that were present at the time of Jesus that all sort of disagreed with each other, both on political and theological issues. One of them being, is Herod a legitimate king or not? Is this temple a legitimate temple or not? And the, the party that said yes were the Sadducees, because they were the ones running the temple. So they might have had some, a bit of uh, uh, motivation for, for wanting to accept Herod as the true king. So they, in general, again, even within the Sadducees, you have disagreements. As we know, just because you have a label like Republican or Democrat, those are not homogenous. Sadducees not homogenous. Jew is not homogenous. Uh, labels are only approximations. But in general, the Sadducees tended to be more favorable towards Herod uh, and the temple, whereas the Pharisees tend to be not so big fans of Herod, but went to the temple anyway because that was the established um, um, that, that was the established institution for expressing their loyalty to, uh, to their God. Um, these are the two main ones. In fact, these parties originated in that time period I skipped over during the Hasmonean uh, debate. They disagreed about who should be the high priest and who should be the king. Um, and so they had actually been fighting for a long time before they show up in the New Testament. Just, just uh, this is more trivia than anything else. The Essenes were the uh, crazy ones. These guys lived in the desert because they didn't believe that the second temple was legitimate at all. And they believed that God was going to return imminently, so they just went and hid in the desert and completely didn't participate in society for the most part. The zealots were the ones that said, uh, Herod is illegitimate and we're going to launch, um, uh, we're going to uh, launch some revolts against the, uh, uh, we're going to launch revolts against the Romans, much like Judah Maccabee, right? That's what they're, they're wanting to do. Um, that, that would be your, your zealots. So has anybody seen Life of Brian? Is that? OK, one, one person? All right. This is where you get the uh, uh, people's front of Judea, or the Judeans' people front. That's where, that's where they fit. That's all right. If you don't get it, that's OK. All right. The Sicarii were insane. These men were assassins. They were basically zealots, but the Sicarii literally means knife men. So they would assassinate leaders. It's, 
it's insane what they would do. Anyway, we're going to focus mostly on the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus didn't do a lot of talking with these guys, although he does have a disciple named Simon the Zealot. So one thing um, important, one very important distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is their understanding of resurrection. The Pharisees would affirm with the seven brothers of 2 Maccabees that yes, there will be a physical resurrection in the future. The Sadducees did not. They, they held the belief that no, when you die, that's kind of it. Your, your soul descends into the grave, um, but there's, no, there's nothing after that. Um, and Sorry. Um, but there, but there's, uh, there's nothing after that. So among many other things that the Sadducees and Pharisees debated, they debated the doctrine of the resurrection. And the question is, where did Jesus fit in on this spectrum? Now, Jesus said a lot of things and had a lot of different uh, agreements and disagreements. We're just going to focus on what he said about resurrection uh, for right now. But he definitely lined up with the Pharisees on the question of, uh, of resurrection. Um, and there's actually a really good passage from Luke 20 that illustrates this. Uh, so in Luke chapter 20, uh, 27 through 40, um, it literally just says, some Sadducees, those who say there are no resurrection, uh, came to Jesus and asked him a question. And essentially, I won't read the whole thing, but they posed this uh, um, thought experiment. They say there was a woman um, who was married and her husband died. But following the Torah, uh, or, she, or uh, her husband died before giving birth, uh, before she gave birth. But following the Torah, her brother, or, sorry, his brother married her. Get that right. His brother married her, but then he died. And so uh, his brother, the next brother in line married her. And then he died. And so seven brothers all in a row married this one woman, none of them giving her children, but they're all following the Torah. So riddle me this, Jesus, which one will be her husband in the resurrection? And Jesus' answer is, well, there isn't marriage in the resurrection because there's no death in the resurrection, which is kind of an interesting response. But the point there being that Jesus responds to that in a very pharisaical way, um, like following what the Pharisees said. Um, and it also illustrates the Sadducees' rejection of, of that. Um, you can also see in uh, the episode with uh, Lazarus in John 11, um, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So Jesus and um, his followers both sort of affirmed that sort of view we talked about from, from 2 Maccabees. Okay. But the important thing is, that Jesus very rarely goes beyond uh, redefining the doctrine of resurrection past what was already sort of understood at that time. But his followers made some very significant changes. And that's what we're going to talk about here in a bit, after Jesus' death. Okay. So let me pause for a second and if there are any comments or questions. I, um, I was looking at a, a parallel to that Luke reference mm -hmm. in Matthew, and I think it's Interesting and notable that in that um, gospel, Jesus says, you are mistaken not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. Mm -hmm. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he sa So he's saying not just that it's the case, but also that the scriptures mm -hmm. say that it's the case. Yeah. He also says in there, uh, it, as he continues, he says, even Moses proves that there's a resurrection. For he says, uh, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, if you read that, since you brought it up, I'll, bring, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. If you read that, how does that answer the question? Like, seriously. God appears to Moses and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your forefathers. Therefore, Jesus says, the resurrection is true. Because God can't be the God of the dead. Yeah. They're, yeah, but they're but remember they're not resurrected though, right? Not yet. Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like they are dead, but they aren't resurrected. So what's the connection? It's, it's not obvious, is it? There is a connection though. <laughs> no, 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 no. Je Jesus was not, not a bee theorist, no. Not going there. But it's, it's weird, right? So this is, this is a text where 
it's, um, th this is a perfect text that illustrates the importance of understanding the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What Jesus' argument is doing, first of all, Jesus' argument is incomplete because he has gotten to the point where the Sadducees know the rest of the argument. And so he doesn't actually finish the thought. But um, there are parallels to this argument in, um, I, believe, I believe in the Mishnah, I could be mistaken on that, uh, but there are very similar Pharisaic arguments that are made because the Pharisees and Sadducees argue with each other. And the, ar the full argument goes like this. If a person dies uh, here on earth um, and they're going to be resurrected at some point in the future, how is it that they can persist through their death? They have to exist in some form, whether as a soul or something like that. So this is what in Christian theology is called the intermediate state. And there's a great deal of speculation as to what that means. Now, the argument is the intermediate state only makes sense. It's only an intermediate state if the resurrection is true. If the resurrection is not true, if that doctrine doesn't happen, there's no intermediate state. There's just you're dead. So the argument that Jesus is making is when God says to Moses, uh, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he implies Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still exist, like they still have some type of life associated with them. And the implication is that God is preserving them in existence in some form so that they can be resurrected in the future so that they can enjoy the earthly blessings here on earth. It's a very... It, that is a word that is used to describe that. Okay. Yes. I'm not going to step on that landmine because it gets to be extremely messy. Uh, but, but that's the essential argument. But their identity is preserved yes. as the main thing. Right, right, exactly. So whenever Jesus says to the Sadducees, well, God says Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are still alive. Oh, okay, well, that's your point. They've, they've already filled in, like, the rest of that inference there. Yes? All right, so it seems like the Pharisees are saying, like, pushing it back all to end times. You yes. Know, everything, just wait, wait until the end time. Uh, after Herod, I think this is reported in John, after he kills John the Baptist, people are like... Is this guy Jesus around? He's like, oh shoot, it's John, he's back. Uh -huh. So, who are the weird people who are talking about resurrections of the average guy? I really wish you did not bring that up. <laughs> that, is, that is the absolute worst uh, uh, text in this entire discussion. Because if you read, seriously, so uh, if, if you read every pagan, like non-Jewish non person uh, who, who's writing, 500, even maybe even 1,000 years prior to Jesus, all the way up to like 500 years after Jesus, you look at all the pagan work, there's no idea of a resurrection. You look at the Jewish work, no idea of a resurrection. Then there's this one text of this one guy that says John the Baptist has returned from the dead. And there are like, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 different interpretations as, uh, to this. Um, one of them may just be that Herod had heard of the idea of resurrection and just kind of was talking about it in an uninformed way, in the same way someone might call Jesus a Jewish zombie, like a Jewish cosmic zombie, like uh, pejoratively. Um, someone who equates zombie with resurrection doesn't understand resurrection, so perhaps Herod was doing the same thing. Uh, it could be the case that it was just a joke, uh, kind of a, I thought I already killed that guy, now there's another one. Um, there are a lot of different interpretations. But the general consensus and the position Wright takes on this is that there's really no reason to think that this particular, there, there's no reason to think that represents a sophisticated uh, commentary on, no, John the Baptist has been risen from the dead, and with that, all the connotations of resurrection. All right. So now we're going to get to the argument, right? And this is where we'll conclude and spend the rest of our time in sort of discussion. So like I said, Jesus pretty much says that he, he pretty much is a Pharisee uh, on resurrection, with minor exception here and there. But after his death, there are three major changes to the doctrine. Um, so the first thing is the resurrection that, uh, doctrine uh, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this was a sort of peripheral issue. They argued about it, but they argued about it in the way that it um, was not really central to their identity. Uh, they were more concerned about things like, is Herod a legitimate king? Uh, is our temple you know, legitimate? Things like that. Um, 
And even within the Pharisees, there's a spectrum of, of views on the resurrection. So there were some Pharisees that said, no, the resurrection body will be uh, shining like a star, like the description in Daniel. Other Pharisees said, no, it'll be more kind of natural, you know, just like your normal body uh, as it is now. And as mentioned, the Pharisees didn't even believe in resurrection. So you have a huge spectrum. But among Christians, there is no spectrum. Uh, everybody agrees on, uh, in the doctrine of the resurrection. And not only do they agree on it, but it is the central confession. As Paul says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died and was raised in accordance with the scriptures. Um, and if Christ has not been raised and there is no resurrection from the dead, your faith is in vain. Paul was a Pharisee who already agreed with the resurrection, but then is now writing, no, this is the central defining feature, and it's happened to Jesus. Secondly, uh, resurrection has been split in two. So like I mentioned earlier, the, um, um, and like the seven brothers had, were saying, resurrection was this far off distant hope. At some point at the end of days, uh, God would act and resurrect everyone from the dead. But now the Christians, they say things like, Jesus is the first fruits amongst many. That was not, some, you know, he's the first one from the dead. And so now you have Jesus being risen um, alive in history now versus, uh, and then there's an additional resurrection far off uh, in, in, in the future. So there's a split in that view. And then thirdly, and most significantly, the resurrection is connected with the idea of messiahship. And so now this is where all of that history that I threw at you, this is where it finally pays off. Remember that the, the theme running through all of that is we need a king, we need a temple, and we need a land. That was what the Messiah was supposed to do. Now, um, a quick side note on this. Uh, when we talk about Messiahship and Messiah expectations in Second Temple Judaism, it's not like there's a checklist of things that the Messiah does A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it's super clear and obvious, and um, you can just take your checklist up to anybody. There were rather... Uh, multi, you know, it was a variegated picture of different expectations about what the Messiah looked like, what he would do. Uh, and there was, the best way to describe it, I think, is a general expectation that God would restore Israel and the Messiah was going to be the man associated with that. This is why men like Cyrus is hailed as a Messiah. If you read Isaiah 45.1, it says the Lord says to his Messiah, Cyrus, uh, let the uh, Jews go back home. But Cyrus, of course, doesn't have like Davidic ancestry, he's not Jewish. It doesn't seem to fit any of the standard uh, markers. But one of the, uh, one of the uh, few common themes that did emerge was that the Messiah of Second Temple Judaism was supposed to overthrow the pagans in a military effort, cleanse the temple or rebuild it, um, and then establish a new independent kingdom. And the thing is that Jesus did not, but, but the thing is that he wasn't going to be raised from the dead because he wasn't going to die in the process of that. You can't be victorious and also killed at the same time. So the fact that Messiahship was, uh, the, the reason that the, 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 the fact that the Christians said Jesus is the Messiah because he has been raised from the dead was a massive change that was unprecedented in any of the variations of, uh, of messianic uh, expectation. And more so than that, but Jesus is almost, believe it or not, the worst candidate for being a Messiah, according to the standard markers. So for the first thing, instead of overthrowing the pagans, he willingly surrenders to Rome, and even says to Peter, after he cuts off Malchus's ear, he's like, don't, don't do that. We don't, we don't, we don't uh, slice people's ears off here. And of course, the discussion with Pilate. Pilate says, you're the king of the Jews, aren't you? And Jesus says, yeah, you say so. He's like, well, where are your servants? Well, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight, would fight for me. But as it is, it's not. Which was exactly opposite of, say, Judah Maccabee, who had a lot of servants fighting for him and launched uh, a military uprising. Um, and then you also consider someone like Maccabee, who cleansed the temple of Greek influence. Well, what did Jesus do? He went into the temple and said, he cleansed it of Jewish influence, actually. Uh, and he said... Um, some pretty provocative things that essentially amounted to God's judgment has fallen on this temple and you need to abandon uh, your attachment to this. You need to abandon your nationalistic attachment to this temple because doing so is going to get you killed by the Romans. And that is exactly what happened. 30 years after Jesus in 70 AD, you had another guy, Simon, Bar Simon Bargiora, another messianic claimant. He's like, we're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to rebuild the temple going to make Jerusalem great again. And he is promptly killed by the Romans 
And it's actually even more intense than that. The Romans come in, they destroy the second temple, slaughter a bunch of people in the process, capture Simon Bargiora, execute him in Rome uh, at the Temple of Jupiter. Which is, he, you know, that is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen if, you kept, uh, if the Jews kept on that. And as if that weren't enough, even after Simon Bargiora got the second temple destroyed, another guy stood up, si uh, Simeon Bar Kokhba. This is about 135 AD. And he says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to rebuild the temple. We're going to make Jerusalem great again. And this time, the Romans say, no. And Emperor Hadrian sent 30% of the Roman military into Judea to destroy 500 and, and murdered, slaughtered, literally 500,000 Jews in that uprising. Uh, and after that, seriously, there was never any hope of a, of a temple or even a Jewish homeland being constructed for literally until the 1940s um, after that, which was very much in line with what Jesus was saying about you need to abandon this zeal for a nationalistic identity, recognize that the kingdom of God has come on earth and to the Gentiles as well. So that is part of the reason, just to close the, the thought on that, that's part of the significance of um, Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we talked about where's that physical sign that God has made his dwelling place with men? Where's that cloud that's descending on people? It shows up in Acts 2, but it doesn't descend on a temple, it descends on a people. And that's one of the major differences uh, that, um, between Second Temple Judaism and, uh, and Christianity. So with all that in mind, you still have this question, why think, like, still, but, like, why did they believe these things? Um, and the answer comes down to, and here's the actual argument, is they found Jesus' tomb empty, and they said that he appeared to them. So here's the argument that Wright uh, presents. So it's a couple of steps. So first, the Christians claim the reason for all of these changes in their belief was because of uh, the empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus after his death. Now, Importantly, an empty tomb, that's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for believing that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Bodies disappear all the time. Um, I've lost a couple myself. I don't know about y'all, but... <laughs> Point number two. Uh, <laughs> the post-death appearances by themselves are not a sufficient condition. They're, uh, they're necessary, of course, but not a sufficient condition. Um, Judaism, just like many other um, religions, was a visionary culture. Uh, and having appearances of people that have been departed happened a lot. But just as we have a lot of different words for saying that people are dead, we have a lot of different words for saying that people appear to us. We can say, I saw Jesus vindicated in heaven. I had a, uh, an experience of him uh, near to me. You know, I, I felt uh, the peace of God um, in my heart or something like that. But none of those types of visionary experiences are sufficient to produce belief in bodily resurrection. So point number four is that if you do have an empty tomb and you do have appearances, then you do have the necessary and sufficient conditions for belief uh, in Jesus, or sorry, belief in resurrection. Um, and so um, as such, that is probably the most historically plausible explanation as to why they believe this. The tomb was empty and they did have appearances. And that's kind of my, uh, my conclusion. Um, we've got a couple minutes here. This is a highly controversial uh, conclusion. And I've made a lot of assumptions. So I'll be very glad to um, go in depth on anything else that, that you'd like. We've got about 10 minutes, actually. So, uh, yeah, what's your name? Uh, I'm Gavin. Yeah. It's a little off topic, but we, there's kind of the argument that all of the disciples basically died mm -hmm. or were martyred for Jesus. Yeah. Um, and that would be like, why would they die for something unless yeah. they literally like, knew this was the case? Mm -hmm. Like, why they allow themselves to be killed for a lie? But yeah. where is it, like, is it just the church fathers wrote it that that is the case, that they all died for that? Or, like, how do we know that that's the case? That is an, that is an excellent question. Um, that, is an, that is a very excellent question. Because um, uh, it segues perfectly, we're doing an event next semester on this, on this topic, uh, we're going to be hosting the Veritas Forum in February on the question, is there anything worth dying for? Now, um, this is a very popular argument, why die for a lie? Um, but the documentation of the martyrdom of the, of the disciples is comparatively thin depending on uh, 
what you, what you consider authoritative. So there's a great book by Sean McDowell, who is our guest speaker. Um, I believe it's called The Fate of the Apostles. And he does a historiographical assessment of what evidence is there for each of the, uh, of, of the disciples um, and the evidence uh, for that. And it comes out that uh, if, you, if you use, uh, he basically comes down that saying that there's really good documentation for Paul. So Paul is pretty much indisputed, died as a martyr. Peter died as a martyr. James, the brother of Jesus, died as a martyr. And uh, I believe James, the son of Zebedee, probably died as a martyr. But there are only about six for which there's uh, reasonable documentation. Or I say reasonable. That's, that's, baking, that's begging the question. For, uh, there's documentation for all of them. But uh, as far as like a secular uh, assessment of it, it, was, it would probably be about those six. So, uh, and, and if you're asking an example of that, um, so with James, uh, one of his martyrdom, he has two martyrdom accounts. One of them is in is in the book, uh, or is in the book, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus. So Josephus actually describes how um, he was dragged uh, before the Sanhedrin. They said, "Renounce your confession." In you know, they're, they're like, "Stop saying Jesus is the Messiah." Which again, side note on that: Why would you claim your dead brother is the Messiah? Right, that's a very weird thing to say. And then on top of that. Consider the fact that as his brother, you're really next in line to be the, his replacement if he goes down. So you should be the Messiah. That, that happened with a lot. That's you know. what the Maccabees did. Yeah. After, yeah, exactly. After Judah, yeah. The Maccabean line, whenever one brother died, the next one would be the Messiah. Anyway, sidebar on that. But yeah, he, and so he, uh, he was either stoned to death or he was thrown off the top of the temple. But he was martyred. The details are, are mixed on that. But, but yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, and remind, remind yeah, everyone your like name. From what we talked about, sort of, oh, my JDM. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, so, from what we talked about sort of at the beginning, and I was just like trying to wrap my brain around this. So like we talked about how we should be thinking of like heaven, less of like this distant faraway place that we're trying to escape to, and more about how like in the future, like heaven and earth will be conjoined. Mm-hmm. And it made me think about that Bible verse. I think there's something in First Peter uh, about like how we should live our lives as pilgrims, mm-hmm. and so like with that in mind, what is that? Because if we're like pilgrims, isn't that sort of like we're thinking of this as not our home? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is something that um, I'd I'd really recommend this book. By the way, this is uh, N.T. Wright. He of course wrote these three big giant books. The distillation of this is in is in this little book, Surprised by Hope. Uh, very good book on this exact question of what, what does it really mean to live in light of, of, of Christian hope. Um, and the general idea, that it's a very multivari- multivariated uh, uh, concept, but the general idea is that we kind of don't have a home in the sense that uh, we don't have binding allegiance to any of the earthly kingdoms. So the best way to think about this, the analogy that he uses, uh, Wright does, is... Um, being a citizen of Rome and living in, say, Philippi, for example. So Philippi was a colony of Rome. So you lived in Philippi, but you were a citizen of Rome. But being a citizen of Rome didn't mean living in Rome. It meant that you, that was where, you know, that was the culture that you were loyal to and all all of that. Um, And so as a citizen of Rome, if you're in Philippi, you're technically, you're, you're, you technically have a home. Um, But if you're in another foreign land that's, say, not, uh, not Roman, um, say you're in, I don't know, uh, one of the, uh, say you're in uh, like China or something, you're a pilgrim in China. Not because your home doesn't exist or you're trying to escape China, but it's just that that land is not where your citizenship uh, is. And so uh, what, what Wright gets at is that there is no land, like that's kind of the point, there is no land that a Christian owns. The whole, the whole earth is God's. Um, but our citizenship is, is in heaven, which leads to some really interesting questions, such as, should American uh, Christians pledge allegiance to the flag? Like, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands? Like, you're pledging your undying fealty and allegiance to a republic represented by a flag? Could you imagine uh, a, a Pharisee doing that to, say, the eagle the, representing Caesar? It's an interesting question. Christians have debated that. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned how 
Jesus was telling people, hey, you need to lose this zeal for your nation and the physical attachment to the temple. Mm -hmm. What are some examples of like verses or scriptures? Oh, man. Um, oh, man, I am not. Uh... Andrew, do you remember one off the top of your head? Like every time he talks about the temple? Pretty much, yeah. It's a good example, though. Well, this Samaritan uh, woman says, "Are we gonna? Are we gonna? Aren't we going? We 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 worship on this hill, but you worship in Jerusalem." And he says, "Well, no. Yeah. Uh, that that's not where." The uh, yeah, I don't I don't have one off the top of my head, unfortunately. So one that comes to mind for me, I was gonna say is just any time when Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple, they're like, look at all these beautiful stones. It's like, yeah, that thing's going to be gone soon anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the one that I and, think about. And this is what, <coughs> if you read N.D. Wright, this is where it gets, like, you have, to, you have to think about what Jesus is doing because he never is explicitly opposing the Jewish authorities because he knows the moment that he does that, they'll kill him, right? So he basically waits, and it's the most uh, obvious thing things he says are right when he comes to Jerusalem and he visits the temple right before his death. So when he's going into, uh, into Jerusalem before the triumphal in, in, uh, entry, he basically prophes prophesies the destruction of the temple. And then once he's in Jerusalem, he, uh, you know, he cleanses the temple. And all of that is him symbolically... Um, symbolically say, well, the, okay, the temple cleansing is a great example. A lot of times we think that he's cleansing the temple because there's money changers and that they're like commercializing it, right? But the word that they're using for, um, for the people that are in the temple is not thieves or like unscrupulous money lenders. It's lusty. It's the same word that's used of the, the thieves that are on the crosses next to Jesus. Um, lusty are bandits that are uh, basically hiding out in the countryside and killing Roman soldiers, right? They are political and military opponents of Rome. So when he says that the temple has become a house of lusty, a, a house of bandits, he's saying that the temple has become a, um, a, a center and a source of this political movement to overthrow the Romans and assert Jewish dominance over the world in like a political uh, or uh, military way instead of them being a light to the world. So that's, that's what he's talking about when he says that, uh, you know, you're, uh, do you put a bowl over your lamp, right? And the Jews are hiding their light. They're putting a bowl over their lamp because instead of being a light to the world, they are plotting on how they can militarily conquer the world, right, and subjugate the, the Gentiles. But it's never explicit because as soon as Jesus says, uh, we, uh, you know, it's bad to seek for a Jewish homeland, he will be killed, right? Okay, I just see the time here. It's 9.35. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, little QR code thingy back up here as soon as I find where it is in the slides here. There we go. So... Um, yeah, we'll stick around and chat for a bit. Rem uh, reminder, please get all the, the candy at the back. Um, but I, I really appreciate y'all uh, being here, and I, I want to respect your time and go ahead and say that if you, need to, if you need to leave, then by all means. So thank you again for your time.